last year in 2022 when Kevin Conroy passed away. I was in the middle of doing other videos and didn't take proper time to make any tributes to honor his memory besides this one community post. Then I woke up on August 27th, 2023 to learn that Arlene Sorkin, the original voice actor for Harley Quinn from Batman the Animated Series, had died the previous day, or somewhere in the middle of those two days, time zones are confusing. Regardless, earlier that same week while I was in town to see the Blue Beetle movie, I had to kill time for about three hours before the showing started, and during those three hours I went to one of my local comic, manga and fantasy game store to browse what they had on sale. I don't know why, but when I saw it, I eventually decided to purchase Mad Love and Other Story soft cover graphic novel by Paul Dini and Bruce Timm. I justified this purchase as an excuse to eventually do a comparison review on Mad Love and its adapted episode of Batman the Animated Series. And then at the end of the week, when I learned about Arlene Sorkin's passing, I thought it would probably be the right time to do the comparison review now as a tribute to her, and put my Batman Hush videos writing on a brief hold. With that being said, Mad Love is a one-shot comic book written by Paul Dini and Bruce Timm, who also drew it with Glenn Murakami, that was first published in December 14th, 1993. The story in it is set in the continuity of Batman the Animated Series, in exploring the origin story of Harley Quinn, who had been created as an original character for the series, in how she went from being the Joker's former psychiatrist in Arkham Asylum, to ending up falling in love with the Joker to become his evil henchwoman. The comic won an Eisner Award and a Harvey Award for Best Single Issue or Story in 1994, and so it went to be seen as everything a comic book should be according to IGN, and according to the Frank Miller quote on the cover of this book I bought, the best Batman story of the decade, which in this case was the 1990s. Paul Dini himself has come to see Mad Love as a cautionary tale about loving someone recklessly and obsessively and for too long, rather than as a victim's tale, by describing Harley's experiences in it as tragicomic reflection of the readers in a distorted funhouse mirror, and all too willing to play the fool for someone we'd be much better off without. Naturally, this original author's intent has gone ignored as the years have gone by, and other writers have put their own spin onto Harley's origin story, after the New 52 and DC Rebirth came to eventually shake up the mainstream DC Comics continuity, where Harley was eventually introduced to in 1999. But that is neither here or there. The purpose of this video is to go over and review this comic first, and then analyze how well it was brought to life by Arlene Sorkin along with Mark Hamill as the Joker and Kevin Conroy as Batman. Here are the obligatory time codes, and now let's go. The story opens with Commissioner Gordon at the doctor's office for a police department required physical checkup. I don't mind saying I really hate these checkups. Hmm. If it weren't part of the police physical, I wouldn't be here at all. To add more insult to his distaste for them, his attending doctor is revealed to be the Joker who has Harley Quinn trapped Gordon into the patient's chair before gagging him. The Joker quickly diagnoses that Gordon is best to be drilled to the face before Batman crashes through the window and mocks the Joker for a poor hint about his plans that probably even Riddler would cringe at. It was an easy hint, Joker. Sloppy. Predictable. You're losing your edge. Excuse me, but the teeth were my idea. Then Harley reveals that the tooth gag was her idea before gassing Batman to immobilize him while also making a joke about it. <laughs> That's a real gasser, huh, Mr. J? <gasps> I give the punchlines around here! Got it? The Joker does not take this well before physically dragging Harley out of the doctor's office, and nonchalantly giving Batman and Gordon a farewell gift as a live grenade. As the Joker laughs in his and Harley's departure, Batman is able to come to his senses in time, to throw the grenade out the window and save both Gordon and himself. 
I really hate these checkups. Later Batman returns to the Batcave to document this encounter with the Joker and based on his dialogue with Alfred, Harley is a recent add-on to the Joker's crew, which then leads to Batman narrating some parts of her backstory to Alfred as an audience surrogate. These snippets include how as Harleen Quinzella she had managed to get herself into Gotham State University on a gymnastic scholarship, and managed to graduate from there with a psychology degree by doing something to her professors that left them alive, happy, and apparently with their pants up. Alfred recalls that Harleen had also written some self-help books as a pop psychologist, which Batman knows that she has by now left those career aspects behind herself. That transitions us to one of the Joker's hideouts, where Harley is trying to affectionately distract him from drawing out his next plans. Ahem. Go away, I'm busy. Ah, oh, come on, Gordon. Don't you want to rev up your Harley? Vroom, vroom. The Joker, already annoyed with Harley ruining his previous plans with Gordon, gives her an earful about it, and agreeing with Batman's mocking words to him, the Joker declares that he needs to do better with his next attack against Batman. Why don't you just shoot him? Then Harley pushes the wrong button by asking why not just pragmatically try shooting Batman, which sends the Joker into a rant over how killing Batman has to be a humiliating masterpiece. The death of Batman must be nothing less than a masterpiece! The triumph of my sheer comic genius over his <laughs> ridiculous mask and gadgets! Coming down from the rant, the Joker sees one of his old plans that focus on dropping Batman into a piranha tank, which could work as a perfect humiliation. But unfortunately, then the Joker remembers that piranhas don't smile, and Batman wouldn't die a humiliating death of a hundred smiles. Even my own Joker talks and couldn't get a giggle out of them. I know how to make some smiles, Puddin'. When Harley tries to comfort her pudding in his desperation, the Joker ends up dragging her by the nose to the door and kicks her outside, wearing nothing but the transparent nightgown she has on. Face it, Harl, this stinks. You're a certified nut so wanted in 12 states and hopelessly in love with a psychopathic clown. Lamenting over her current situation as a wanted criminal, Harleen almost seems to come across like she is coming to think clearly about it, but then ends up reinforcing her bad situation to be Batman's fault for not letting her be together with the Joker. And that then leads to Harley thinking back to her first days at Arkham, where she first met the Joker as Dr. Harleen Quinzel, I'm Joan Leland. Hi Joan, call me Harley. Everyone does. As a wide-eyed interim psychologist who wanted to make it big by writing a book on Arkham's committed supercriminals, and while ignoring senior doctor Joan Leland's warnings about the dangerous inmates, Harleen is distracted by the Joker who clearly recognizes her as an easy mark. He passively started to put his moves onto her by smuggling a rose to Harleen's office, and when she came to confront him about it. The Joker plays his cards right by first complimenting her name, Harley Quinzel. Rework it a bit, and you get Harley Quinn. And then promising to reveal his secrets to make Harleen choose to make him the subject of her book. After three months of pleading, they had their first interview session where the Joker tells her a sob story about his abusive father taking him to the circus and that being the only time the young Joker had seen his father happy without abusing him. My father used to beat me up pretty badly. Anything except that. Every time I got out of line, BAM! Or sometimes I'd be just sitting there doing nothing. POW! Pops tended to favor the grape, you see. Uh-huh. There was only one time I ever saw Dad really happy. He took me to the circus when I was seven. Oh, I still remember the clowns running around, dropping their pants. <laughs> My old man laughed so hard, I thought he'd bust a gut. So the very next night, I ran out to meet him with his best Sunday pants around my ankles. Hi, Dad! Look at me! Zoop! I took a big prat 
football and tore the crotch clean out of his pants. <laughs> <laughs> and then he broke my nose. But hey, that's the downside of comedy. You're always taking shots from folks who just don't get the joke. Like my dad. Or Batman. Naturally, the Joker used that sob story to build himself sympathy in Harleen's eyes, and using it as a bridge to make Batman come across as another abuser like his father. Interview sessions like these, in some of which she then ended up sharing her feelings about the Joker to him, then ended up coloring Harleen's image of the Joker and his antagonistic relationship with Batman to the point that eventually when the Joker escaped from Arkham for an entire week, Harleen was more interested about his safety rather than his potential victims and gave Batman an angry look when he brought a heavily battle-damaged Joker back to Arkham. That incident was then the last straw with how Harleen had been conditioned over her sessions with the Joker. That she went to rob a costume store for equipment to reinvent herself as Harley Quinn and break the Joker out of Arkham. Knock knock pudding! Say hello to your new improved Harley Quinn! And I think the Joker is laughing over the fact that even he probably couldn't see how his conditioning on Harleen could have gone this far. At this point, the flashback is over as Harley in the present day realizes that her dreams of a life with the Joker can't happen when Batman is in their way. She then sneaks back inside the Joker's hideout to find him worn out and asleep, and gets an epiphany with the discarded piranha plan. Sometime later, Harley has sent a VHS, 90s remember, recorded a message to Batman and the GCPD, where she claims to have come to her senses because the Joker has bombs to kill everyone in Gotham to one-up the doctor's office plan fiasco. I finally realized this isn't funny anymore. I can help you get him, if you promise me protection. Harley in the video asks Batman to come meet her alone, so she can pass the plan she has stolen from the Joker. When Batman goes to see Harley... I want Gordon to see these. If what you say is true, the police will... Traitor! <gasps> no one turns to the army and lives! The Joker suddenly appears to attack them, and while defending them from a robot mannequin, Harley drugs Batman so much that when he wakes up... Quinn... Oh, you're awake finally! The Joker... where? He is hung upside down above a tank full of piranhas and Harley suited up in her bodysuit. Harley explains to Batman's confusion that she lied about the Joker having bombs, and that she has Batman alone at her mercy to kill him with a fixed version of the Joker's piranha plan. TLDR, if Batman is made to hang upside down above the piranhas, then from his point of view, the piranhas' grimaces would also be upside down, and the last thing Batman would see is their smiles. Clever? Brilliant. Begrudgingly, Batman recognizes the brilliancy of the death trap, which Harley is fine with, if it ends up resulting with her and the Joker being together. You and the Joker? Right, a Rooney! <laughs> I never seen you laugh before. I don't think I like it. Cut it out. And that is where Batman's stoic facade cracks as he starts to laugh at the absurdity of the Joker loving anyone but himself, which Harley tries to justify with the secrets the Joker told her when she was his doctor. But Batman narrating them to her before Harley causes her to realize that the Joker has been lying and using her from the start. Stop it! You're making me confused! What was it he told that one parole officer? Oh yes. There was only one time I ever saw Dad really I'm happy. He took me to the ice show when I was seven. 
circus. He said it was the circus. He's got a million of them, Harley. You're wrong! My foot does let me does! You're the problem! However, Harley decides to ignore the reality and relapses back to her original mindset of blaming Batman for everything. Batman, on the other hand, points out that the Joker will never believe he is dead as the piranhas wouldn't leave anything left to identify. True, you've got my belt, but it's not the same as a body. You'll never buy it. So Harley ends up calling the Joker about you have who kind of where? This leads to the Joker charging to her location while imagining the ridicule he would get and so ignores the police seeing where he is going. Which leads to Commissioner Gordon, Harvey Bullock and Rene Montoya to respond in pursuit. At her hideout, Harley is bragging to Batman about the Joker being on his way and again fantasizes about their life together. Harley! With the Joker's arrival then hitting her with the reality. While asking Batman to stand by, the Joker furiously yells at Harley about killing Batman being his exclusive right, which Harley tries to support by pointing out his original plan being tuned up with Batman hanging upside down. This only ends up making the Joker angrier because by his philosophy, Explain it to me! If you have to explain a joke, there is no joke! And ironically, the Joker then attacks Harley with the same justification that his father used to abuse him as a child. Calm down, Putin. You've forgotten what I told you a long time ago. One of the painful truths of comedy. You always take shots from folks who just don't get the joke! Before ultimately pushing Harley out of the fifth floor window to the streets below. And don't call me Puddin. Where the police arrive and Harley is found blaming herself by Detective Montoya. My fault. I didn't get the joke. While Commissioner Gordon and Lieutenant Bullock rush upstairs, the Joker releases Batman with apologies and almost walking away. I really have to apologize for the kid. No respect for tradition. <laughs> Let's just pretend the whole thing never happened and do this some other time. Okay. Then again... Before realizing he might as well go for the pragmatism with the opportunity he has with Batman tied up. <laughs> Batman being Batman is however able to counter the Joker's gun to instead be fired at the piranha tank and release the piranhas on the Joker while he hopes to get the lockpicks from his utility belt. The Joker flees and is delayed by Gordon and Bullock for Batman to catch up with him when he is freed and eventually their chase leads to the rooftops and on top of a moving subway train. She almost had me, you know. There Batman, rather amused with himself, mocks the Joker about the fact that Harley actually managed to get him into a death trap from which Batman was only able to escape by convincing Harley to call him and expect the Joker to be himself. Arms and legs chained, dizzy from the blood rushing to my head. But I had no way out other than convincing her to call you. Arms straight. I knew your massive ego and would never allow anyone else the honor of closed. killing me. When also telling the Joker that Harley got closer to killing him, Put. Batman lures the Joker into a berserker rage that leads them to fight to the point where Batman ends up punching the Joker off the train and fall into a smokestack. <laughs> The story then ends in Arkham Asylum, where a badly wounded and patched up Harleen is taken to her cell, with her internal monologue seeming to come across as her having had enough of putting up with the Joker. Joe Leland, that senior doctor who welcomed her to the Arkham staff long time ago, visits Harleen to ask how she feels now for having ignored her warnings and ending up as the Joker's property. However, whatever Harleen was about to say in response, 
is overruled by a similar rose as the one the Joker had smuggled into her office years ago with a get well soon card. Angel. Which so causes Harleen Quinzel to relapse back into Harley Quinn. By today's standards, where Harley Quinn has gone from the Joker's henchwoman to whatever the New 52 wanted her to be with the Suicide Squad, Mad Love can be seen now as a time capsule from better days. Better days as in when the writers had the courage to tell a story about truth in television. The abusive relationship between Harley and Joker is not romanticized, but rather shown exactly as it is. Paul Dini's comparison of it to a cautionary tale works in showing how Harleen wanted to exploit the Arkham inmates for a book to make profit, and then ignored warnings given to her that ended up making her being exploited without even realizing it instead. There are some moments where Harleen seems to realize the situation she is in, but ultimately she ends up relapsing back to the codependency she has with the Joker as Harley. Unlike some current reinterpretations that have made Harleen break herself free from being the Joker's property, for at least four to six times I managed to count when I did my Injustice game recap video two years ago, in Mad Love, Harley's situation was portrayed like a realistic domestic abuse victim, and how she ended up in that situation without putting much effort into getting out of it is what makes the cautionary tale aspect work. And of course, most people today seem to ignore that aspect in favor of skipping over it, so they can get to instead see the revenge fantasy of Harley breaking up with the Joker again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Or that is how I see it as someone who is not exactly qualified to talk about the subject. It is however somewhat ironic that in the end the Joker ended up acting exactly like the probably imaginary father that he kept telling multiple different stories about. And then when Batman brings up that the Joker has told that story to multiple other people before, I find myself questioning on how come none of those stories have been documented for Harleen to look up between her interview sessions with the Joker. It could be that she probably did come across those documents, but was so far gone by then that she ignored them and forgot ever seeing them until Batman brought the stories up. Anyway, let's next go over the art by Bruce Timm and Glenn Murakami before moving on to the Beatles episode that adapted the comic. The style is pretty much the same as the animation in Batman the Animated Series, with the same character designs and some differentiated coloring, but also some brighter lightings and more expressive faces. This is probably how a still image can have more details in it than an animation cell that has to be redrawn multiple times. Although Batman himself looks kind of silly here and there when he is caught off guard, and some of these splash pages seem to have been prioritized to be drawn to look cool more, rather than have realistic proportions. They kind of remind me of Andy Kubert's drawing style, which I again wish to have been made into its own animation style. Okay, I think I have said enough to now talk about the... Oh right, this was a uh, The New Batman Adventures episode, and not a Batman the Animated Series episode. Looking at how the comic was adapted as an episode of the new Batman Adventures instead of Batman the Animated Series, we have Batman wearing a darker costume and the Joker looks like one of the Animaniacs. Then the fact that Mad Love was adapted as an episode of the new Batman Adventures. We end up with some continuity hiccups with the flashbacks that are supposed to be set during the Beatles era, where Batman and the Joker have their TNBA designs. 
also, Poison Ivy has a blink and you miss background cameo, which would suggest that the episode takes place after the Beatles episode Pretty Poison, which happened to air two days after Harley's debut in Joker's favor, meaning that Pamela Isley had not been caught attempting to murder Harvey Dent yet, and so shouldn't be an Arkham inmate at this point. There are also some small scenes cut to help with the pacing and scene transitionings. Like, for example, the opening scene has Gordon on his way to his physical checkup without being called by the receptionist. But also the scene with Batman and Alfred going over Harley's background in the Batcave is cut. This was probably done because the new Batman Adventures along with Beatles was intended at the youngest for nine-year-olds. Ei herra jumala! I was three to four years old and in kindergarten when I first watched this cartoon. That scene was likely cut by the network censors because of the implications that Harleen had slept her way to graduating from Gotham University were seen as unsuitable for the intended audiences. That same censorship also made this scene of the Joker hitting Harley when arriving after being called there to see Batman tied above the piranha tank to cut away to Batman reacting to it happening instead of showing it as it happens. Also, there are no imaginary scenarios showcased of Harley fantasizing of her life with the Joker, or of the Joker dreading of Riddler, Two-Face and the Penguin mocking him as the guy whose girlfriend killed Batman, or as Mr. Harley Quinn. And then there is this funny dialogue change that was probably done just because the Joker is voiced by Mark Hamill. May the floss be with you! <laughs> Otherwise, a majority of the dialogue is unchanged and almost lifted word for word from the comic, as I showcased during the story commentary, and which I also used to showcase the vocal range of the voice actors, especially how Arlene Sorkin managed to create a difference between her performance as Harley and as Harleen. Don't you want to rev up your Harley? Vroom, vroom. Like the clown character Harlequin. I know. I've heard it before. However, as the episode is set in the TNBA era, Batman as the hero antagonist is somewhat portrayed as more experienced than his younger counterpart from the BTAS era, like when throwing the live grenade out of the window much faster and being calmer in the explosion's aftermath, as well as not having as shocked expressions when Harley drugs him and before he starts to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen you laugh before. I don't think I like it. Cut it out! It's a damn it's shame we never got Kevin Gordon to watch Batman who laughs. It was also probably easier not to animate a torn version of Batman's costume for this flashback scene. Commissioner Gordon, Lieutenant Bullock and Detective Montoya are not included to come across Harley falling from the fifth floor, but she still ends up being taken back to Arkham like if she called an Uber for herself. Dr. Leland is also cut out from the end of the episode, probably because it would have come across as too mean-spirited after her previous appearances like in the Harley's Holiday episode, where Harleen was briefly deemed sane and Dr. Leland was supportive of her there. So Harleen's relapse back into Harley is done during her internal monologue instead. Well, there was a five-year gap between the publication of the comic book and the release of the episode. Pretty much like with Joe Kelly coming back to write Superman vs. The Elite. Paul Dini and Bruce Timm, or just Paul Dini came back to write the episode while Bruce Timm was probably busy with something production related. They both do have the story credit, but the writing credit is solely given to Dini, who might as well cling beer pins with Joe Kelly at a bar, for successful self-adaptations of their pre-existing works. Only the animation style was a small hiccup that ended up causing a few continuity snarls, but on its own the episode is not a bad adaptation. It's not great, but it's good enough. I just wish that I had managed to get this comparison review done under happier circumstances, when more than just two of its cast members were still alive. Bob Hastings, who voiced Commissioner Gordon, died back in 2014. We lost Kevin Conroy as Batman last year in 2022. And now Arlene Sorkin as the original Harley Quinn is also gone. 
I was unable to properly respond to the latter two. Well, not better than with this community post I did. But for the recently passed away Arlene Sorkin, I dedicate this video for her and her efforts for how she managed to influence Batman's lore and rogues gallery. As I wrote into my community post from last year in honoring Kevin Conroy, thanks for the memories Arlene, and good luck for the journey you now have in the next life. And now it's back to working on that hush video. While you wait for me to get that video script written and eventually edited into video, remember to like this video, comment something about Harley Quinn or about both versions of Mad Love, share this video for more people to see, and subscribe for everything else I have coming up next. Also, ding the bell for when I'm doing gameplay streams for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.